here are the craziest survival stories. Number 6. Salvador Alvarenga Many people have gotten lost at sea, but few people actually live to tell the tale. Salvadoran fisherman Salvador Alvarenga is one of the lucky ones. Alvarenga, an experienced sailor and fisherman, set out on a 30-hour shift of deep-sea fishing with a fellow fisherman named Ezekiel Cordoba. On November 17, 2012, accompanied with Cordoba, they set out on their trip even after being warned of a coming storm. That's the first sign of not going on a 30-hour fishing trip, if you ask me. In just a couple of hours after sailing, the waves were getting too strong and the small boat started filling with water. Although they had caught nearly 1,100 pounds of fresh fish, they were forced to dump it overboard to make the boat maneuverable in bad weather. A few hours later, with the storm still going strong and just when they could see the mountains of the coast, the motor died. Of course, the boat started drifting away. They tried calling for help with the radio and soon enough, it died on them. They had pretty much zero chances of getting rescued at this point. Nobody knew where they were and they had no way of getting anywhere they wanted. The search party organized by Alvarenga's boss failed to find any trace of them and gave up after two days of search because of poor visibility due to the five-day storm. As days became weeks, Alvarenga and Cordova supposedly learned to scavenge their food from fish, turtles, jellyfish, and seabirds with their bare hands. Cordoba lost all hope around four months into the voyage and he eventually died because he refused to eat. Alvarenga claimed to have seen numerous ships while drifting alone, but he was unable to solicit help. He was able to keep track of time by counting the phases of the moon. After 15 months, he spotted land, a tiny desolate islet, which turned out to be a remote corner of the Marshall Islands. He abandoned his boat and swam to shore, where he stumbled upon a beach house owned by a local couple. Somehow, some way, Alvarenga made it back on land alive. His journey had lasted 438 days. The length of his voyage has been calculated anywhere from 5,500 to 6,700 miles. The implausibility of someone surviving so long at sea on such a small boat led many to doubt Alvarenga's story, although investigators were able to confirm some of the basic details. Tom Armbruster, the United States ambassador to the Marshall Islands, acknowledged that it seems implausible for someone to survive at sea for 13 months, but that, quote, it's also hard to imagine how someone might arrive on Ebon out of the blue. Certainly this guy has had an ordeal and has been at sea for some time. Alvarenga to this day still fishes for a living. I bet he's only going fishing on sunny days if I had to put a bet on it. Number five, Mauro Prosperi. Have you ever done a marathon in the desert? Yeah, me neither. Running a marathon through the desert is on my list of things to never do. However, for Italian police officer Mauro Prosperi, a 155 mile race in the Sahara Desert was his definition of fun. Until it wasn't. Very few people actually run this marathon, but of course, Prosperi was one of them. On the fourth day of the six day race, a sandstorm started and caused Prosperi to lose his direction. He ended up disoriented and ran in the wrong direction, ultimately running over 100 miles into Algeria. After 24 hours, he ran out of food and water. He arrived at an abandoned Muslim shrine complete with a corpse. To avoid dehydration, he started drinking his own urine and started walking only when the sun wasn't up. Wow! Not wanting to have a long, drawn-out death, he actually tried to commit suicide by cutting his wrist, but his blood was too thick from dehydration and ultimately clotted his wounds. He regained his composure and went on. After nine days alone in the desert, he was found by a family who took him to an Algerian military camp and from there to a hospital. Because of the sandstorm, he ended up 186 miles off route and lost 40 pounds in body weight. 40 pounds in nine days is just insane. When he was rescued, his liver and eyes were severely damaged. He had to stay on a liquid diet for months and it took almost two years before he fully recovered. Number four, Aaron Ralston. I'm sure a lot of you guys have probably heard of the movie 127 Hours. It's the story of a hiker who was trapped in a Utah canyon and had to cut his own arm to get out. I don't think I really need to illustrate how ridiculous that is to do. 
The story starts with Ralston deciding to go out to do some climbing on his own back in 2003. He went climbing without telling anyone where he would be. As a dedicated climber, Ralston was used to hostile environments. However, because even experience isn't safe 100% of the time, Ralston slipped and fell down between two canyon walls. In his fall, Ralston dislodged a stone boulder, which trapped his arm just below the elbow to the wall. Unfortunately, nothing could get his arm free. By nightfall, he was still trapped against the wall without any progress. Nobody knew he was there. No one was missing him. Eventually, he figured out in order to survive, he would have to cut his own arm. I really don't want to go through all the details, but just know that all he had to work with was a small pocket knife. Let's just say a pocket knife can't cut through bone, so yeah. After freeing himself, he walked out of the canyon where a family found him and took him to the hospital. Five days later than when he expected to go back home. What percentage of the population do you guys think would be able to do what Ralston did? I'm putting it at less than 1%. Let me know what you think. Number three, Joe Simpson and Simon Yates. Joe Simpson and Simon Yates are climbers who escaped death in the Sula Grande mountain in Peru back in 1985. They decided to climb the mountain alpine style, which means climbing with only the equipment they had on their back. That means no base camps, no backup team, no helicopters, no GPS, and no one to track where they were. Simpson and Yates made it to the top of the 21,000 foot high mountain in three days, but their luck ran out when they started their descent. The weather quickly turned bad in their descent as they faced dangerous ridges and slopes in worsening weather. The worst moment came when Simpson stepped on a rock and fell, causing his leg to shatter. This is the type of injury that basically means death for Simpson in that situation. However, even with one of them with a shattered leg, Yates attempted to get them both out alive. To continue their descent, Yates used ropes to lower Simpson down the mountain in stages. It got to a point where Yates lowered Simpson over an unseen cliff edge, which meant that Simpson was hanging over a deep crevice with only Yates' hold on the rope to prevent him from falling. However, Yates was stuck in a situation where he was unable to bring Simpson up or lower him down. Basically, Yates was left with a hard choice. By not cutting Simpson, their chances to survive would have been basically zero, as they couldn't go anywhere. Yates decided to cut the rope. Simpson fell approximately 50 feet into the crevice. Somehow, he survived the fall, but Yates assumed Simpson couldn't have possibly be alive. Simpson managed to climb out of the crevice and reach base camp four days later. Even though Yates cut the rope, Simpson has always defended Yates over his decision and is adamant he would have done exactly the same thing in order to survive. They actually went on to go on more climbs together, but supposedly have fell out of touch over the years. Number 2. Douglas Mawson In 1912, Douglas Mawson was the leader of the Australasian Antarctic Expedition, a team that hoped to unravel some of the mysteries surrounding the Antarctic. Along with Xavier Mertz and Belgrave Ninnis, their plan was to map some of the unknown lands in that area. Do I need to tell you guys that things didn't go according to plan? By day 35 of the expedition, the trio had reached a point nearly 300 miles from their starting point. The men had crossed two major glaciers and scores of hidden crevices, deep fissures, and the ice camouflaged by thin snow bridges. They were crossing over what's now known as Ninnis Glacier, when things went wrong. Mertz was skiing and Mawson was on the first sled, with Ninnis jogging beside the second sled. All of a sudden, Ninnis fell through a massive crevice along with the six best dogs, almost all of the party's food, their three-man tent, and other essential supplies. Mertz and Mawson spotted a couple of the dogs on a ledge 165 feet below them, but Ninnis was never seen again. Mertz and Mawson decided that their best chance for survival meant heading back to camp. During their trek back, their huskies gave out one by one. Sadly, when each dog could no longer pull, they were shot. In order to survive, both men had to eat their travel companions. Both men suffered dizziness, nausea, and a whole bunch of other ailments. However, something had become very wrong with Mertz. He had lost a lot of weight, and he couldn't walk. Mertz ended up passing in Mawson's arms. 
It was unknown at the time that husky liver contains extremely high levels of vitamin A, which can cause liver damage to humans. It's thought that they ingested enough liver to bring on a condition known as hypervitaminosis A. Devastated and alone, Mawson still had 80 miles to go. Several days later, he made it close enough to the base where he was spotted by one of the crews that had chosen to stay behind looking for the lost team. Wait, did you think this ended here? Unfortunately for Mawson and the crew, the ship that was to take them back to civilization had left earlier by just five hours. Instead, they had to wait another 10 months in the windiest place on Earth to wait for a rescue. Just wow. Number one, Ricky McGee. In late January of 2006, 35-year-old Ricky McGee was driving across Australia on the Bunting Highway on his way to a new job. He stopped to help a group of stranded motorists near the West Australian border and agreed to drive them to the nearest town. Pretty much a scene out of a bad horror film happened. McGee ended up being drugged by one of the passengers and left to die in a ditch. He woke up wrapped in plastic without shoes with dingoes or basically wild dogs scratching at his plastic wrapping wanting to eat him. McGee wandered aimlessly for 10 days barefoot before setting up camp under an old cattle trough beside a dam. At night, he decided to block up the opening to his sleeping area with stone so if he happened to die in his sleep, dingoes wouldn't feast on his body. He survived this way for 71 days in one of the most isolated places in Australia. He had survived by catching frogs, lizards, and snakes, and by drinking water from the dam. McGee had lost more than half his body weight over the 10-week ordeal. He was eventually, finally, discovered and rescued by workers at a sheep station. McGee was so far out in the middle of nowhere, his only plan was basically to survive and pray that someone would find him. Because if he had left his makeshift home, he probably wouldn't have ever made it back. Here's what's next. This Brazilian city has lots to offer tourists. Beautiful beaches with beautiful people. Christ the Redeemer. Tijuca National Park. Oh, and don't forget the 2016 Summer Olympics. However, crime rates are also very high. In August, the Telegraph reported that crime in the